Heyo, Weibo here. And before I say another word, this is not the video that's been preoccupying me. In fact, such a thing doesn't exist. I'll delve into this topic in another video that will hopefully accompany this one on release. But for now, enjoy my garbage content and welcome back to my cozy hellhole. Summoning methods. In Persona, they are a staple into the explanation as to why these stupid high schoolers are able to summon their powers. Well, except for one and the two duology, but hey, those games don't exist to Atlas, so they don't exist to me either. Ignoring the abandonment of old IPs, these summoning methods are more than a mere excuse to give teenagers the ability to kill literal gods, but they also serve a narrative purpose as well. So, let us take a deep dive into these, starting with the original, and by far the edgiest of them all. Thank you, 2000s, you weird-ass decade that I have the pleasure to never consciously experience. They killed themselves. But, to be more descriptive, summoning a persona in this title involves the use of a device called an evoker, which is shaped like a gun. In various ways, the main cast will turn it on themselves and pull the trigger, but instead of the sweet release of death, they summon their persona. How disappointing. Alright. So, before I waffle any further, I should address the elephant in the room. Why? Is this just a remnant of teenage angst and edginess so specifically prevalent of its time? Surprisingly? No. See, life and death is a constant theme in Persona 3, and this summoning plays into it heavily. The evokers are specifically shaped like a gun and pulled on their own user as a representation of the confrontation of death a reality and inevitable end for every living being on this earth. It's required to summon their personas not due to the actual mechanics of the evoker, but instead of what pulling a trigger while the barrel stares into your head means, specifically in the context of not letting the looming threat of our end halt the limited life that we currently have. This is addressed right in the beginning of the game, with Yukari being shown struggling with a gun-shaped object that would later be revealed to be an evoker ending with her unable to go through with using it. Of course, you can learn more about why she struggled so much to use the evoker later, but to avoid spoilers, that will be saved for a more comprehensive video of her character. However, after the tutorial, she does later find the resolve to use it, signifying a development in her character, overcoming past tragedy, and her perception of death. This kind of symbolism, while at first appearing like the edgy, life doesn't matter, garbage narrativization, turns out to be a direct refutation to it by painting a clear image of the end, and when combined with the rest of the narrative, highlights the beauty of living better than most media I've seen could hope to achieve. However, this next game dominates in symbolism as well, just focusing on a bit of a different theme. Prepare to face your true self, because up next is Persona 4. Wait a second. No, we are not doing this transition again. Oh wait. I'm doing it right now. Well, uh, just cut back to the video. Three, two, one. Persona 4's themes lie mainly in self-actualization, or, as described in the game, finding the truth. While taken literally, this means finding the true identity of the Inaba murderer, as a metaphor that is presented in the game, it means discovering exactly who you are and the challenges that accompany such a journey. So, that brings us back around to the whole summoning methods thing. What is it, and how does it connect to these themes? Well, before anyone in the main cast is able to summon a persona, they must face a representation of themselves, the part of themselves that they are unable to accept. Naturally, when confronted about a part of yourself you find unsavory, especially in the presence of outsiders, your first reaction is to deny and cower from the part of yourself you hate, justified or not. But after the mandatory RPG boss fight, the characters learn to confront these parts of themselves, and in doing so, obtain their persona. Jungian psychology, with the mention of personas and shadows being one and the same aside, each character must go through a process of self-actualization to even become a persona user to begin with. With that said, we can finally talk about the summoning method, which is the destruction of a tarot card specific to each character. Now, tarot cards have been a staple of the series, being used from the beginning, and they always represent a sense of fate and destiny, much like their meaning in real life. So, with that in mind, it seems pretty clear that in order to summon their persona, 
they obtain by accepting themselves, they not only reject the predestined fate represented by the tarot card, they destroy it, thus freeing themselves to find their own truth in life. Using Mr. Fruit Basket as an example, he comes to accept his more feminine side and his sexuality facing his shadow. So, for him, destroying his tarot card meant defying the fate of cultural expectations of what men are supposed to be, especially for a 2008 Japan. Revolutionary in the context of cultural norms that surrounded it at its time. Of course, only beat by the revolutionary themes of our last and latest mainline game in the series, Persona 5. Persona 5 is bold, both in visual design and in the thematic tie-in weaved throughout it. Similar to the last entry in the series, P5 uses personas to represent pieces of oneself they hide away. However, the focus is shifted less on the individual this time, and more on broader society. In the context of P5's world, your persona is akin to your revolutionary spirit, beginning in our characters suppressed and buried deep within them in the confines of the overbearing culture of conformity present in Japanese society. For more information on the cultural side of this, you should check out these videos on screen right now. They'll be linked in the description. Tying into this, a requirement for unlocking one's persona in this game is to directly challenge authority and rise up for what's right instead of what's safe or even societally convenient. Once the game characters have done this, their persona will come out to them, often commenting on how long they've been suppressed. Then they will fiercely rip the mask off their face, which might be a slight nod to how difficult it is to overcome the polite society expectation and to fight for change. Because when you're doing that, you may as well be ripping the skin off your face to an ever-static status quo. After they awaken their personas, their first act is always to combat their oppressor, further hammering in the revolutionary themes of the game. Throughout the game, the Phantom Thieves, which for all intents and purposes is a vigilante group, fight and bring forth justice where society turns a blind eye. Which doesn't solely bring challenge to those who they bring down, but also the society as a whole, and exposes it for its permission of frankly some pretty disgusting and reprehensible characters. It is absolutely an intentional writing decision that all the villains in the game are extremely prominent people in positions of power, and that the future Phantom Thieves become disillusioned to the society and the parts of themselves that work to cover up the atrocities committed. A great example of this is Yusuke as a character, who is trapped in an abusive parental relationship with Madarame, his master, both due to the subtle coercion of being dependent on Madarame for food and shelter as well as society's perception of Madarame as a great, humble artist that would make it impossible to come out with his story. He aggressively denies being abused both to the Phantom Thieves and to himself. However, due to a mishap by the cast, he is able to see the palace of Madarame and is faced with the reality of his master's character and how he's been used. He then finally gains the conviction to free himself and through his first act of rebellion, awakens to his persona, allowing him to finally fight back against the monster who took everything from him. The way that details as small as these can have enough meaning for a fairly long and advertisable YouTube video shows the depth of narrative present, and one of the many reasons I love the series despite some of the glaring issues. That aside, thank you for dealing with my shit, and hope you enjoyed the first real video since I've disappeared. Peace.